very good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Our topic focuses on a review of best practices for complying with OSHA laws and CDC guidance during COVID-19. My name is Adam, Content Marketing Specialist with Henry Shine, and I'll be your moderator. If during the presentation you have questions, please type them into the Q&A and we will answer them live at the end as time allows. This webinar is sponsored by Henry Shine Dental and no CE credits are being offered for viewing this presentation. It is my pleasure to introduce Carson Carpenter as today's speaker. Carson practices dentistry in Michigan and serves as the president and CEO of Compliance Training Partners. Thanks for being with us today, Carson. Over to you. Welcome to everybody to this webinar. Thanks to Henry Schein for inviting me to do this webinar. And of course, as the title implies, it's all about regulations, um, not, not only during COVID-19, but, but even after COVID-19. How, how do we comply? And to me, most important is, is a practicing dentist, how do we stay profitable in the COVID-19 environment? So with that, let me go over some course objectives. I mean, I've done a lot of webinars for Henry Schein, for different national groups since March. And the course has changed. It used to be about the basics. Now it's about, we're all out there practicing, but still, we need to do a quick review of epidemiology of COVID-19, understanding the latest guidelines. I'm gonna go over the latest CDC as well as OSHA uh, requirements. Signs and symptoms of the disease, which have changed a little bit over time. Uh, talking about how we can prevent transmission. That's a big part of today. Understanding how to pick the appropriate PPE, of course, extremely important. There's often a lot of questions about things like uh, face coverings, face mask, and 95 mask, and I'm going to go over that. Also, developing a plan for performing procedures in your office, in your state, based on your state and local guidelines. And, of course, understanding your requirements under the law. And also, I want to go over best practices for infection control. I've got a lot of good news for you, too. I think that a lot of the COVID-19 webinars have been um, a real downer with lots of negative things, but I've got a lot of positive things to report today, and I'm looking forward to telling you about that. Also, understanding cost-effective ways to practice in the new environment, because, you know, according to the statistics that, that I've seen, practices are operating seeing about 70, 75% of the patients that they used to see. Part of it is um, not as many patients coming in, but most of it is that it takes longer. So we need to know how to do it prof profitably. And of course, the disclaimer is important. Uh, the information contained in this is based on the latest guidelines. I stay abreast of them, but things can change. And remember that uh, our, our agents, dealers, distributors can't be held responsible for legal actions, citations, penalties, fines. It's ultimately the responsibility of the business owner to stay current with these regulations. That said, this is going to be very current. Now, the federal government released a plan some time ago about reopening businesses. The problem is it hasn't gone quite according to plan. The plan included healthcare businesses like dentistry and it utilized gating criteria. Um, and again, it allowed the states to determine, states and even regions within the states to determine how they're going to reopen. I'll give you an example, my state, Michigan, Things were different in the southern part of the state versus the northern part. Now, I've actually put that document at compliancetrainingpartners.com. Many times I'll refer to documents that would just take too long to go over. They're on the website under COVID-19 Learn More. Now, in the phased approach, what the federal government said is the states develop and implement appropriate policies, regulations, and guidance, and, and use industry best practices. So, so that's what our states are doing. It doesn't matter you know, which, which state you're in. Um, and for, I see the attendees here, we're talking to people in, in pretty much all 50 states. Wherever you're at, social distancing is still important. Sanitation and disinfection, all super important. In this phased approach, um, of course, it, it, it's all about best practices. And it's about transitioning, transitioning our practices then back to normal, which is where we're going to get someday. If your community is experiencing minimal to moderate or substantial transmission, which that's pretty much everybody I'm talking to here, elective dental care can be provided. We're all providing elective dental care now. We have been for quite a while. So what we want to talk about is how can we do this safely? So this presentation is going to assume 
that you live in a community that, that's not in the bubble, that there is at least somewhere in your state, somewhere in your region, there's some confirmed cases of COVID-19. I think that's everybody here. Um, as I do, regularly consult your state and local health departments. Look at the numbers. I look at the numbers almost every day. See where you're going and understand what type of community spread you have in your area. Now, where does OSHA come in all this? I mean, I've been teaching OSHA compliance since 1988. And what OSHA's role always is, is to make the workplace safe for employees. A lot of times people will say to me things like, uh, well, does OSHA approve this autoclave? Or does OSHA approve this disinfectant? And they don't do that. OSHA would say, autoclave, have you taught the employee to use it safely? Disinfectant, have you trained them what hazardous chemicals in? Um, do they have protective equipment that they need uh, to protect themselves from the chemicals? But one thing OSHA has done regarding COVID-19, they've announced they're going to conduct more on-site inspections due to concerns about COVID-19. They've also announced COVID-19 is what they call a reportable illness. So in other words, if case of COVID-19, um, it was transmitted in the office to a worker, then that needs to be reported to OSHA. Um, if it involves hospitalization or treatment, other than just taking off from work. Now, following OSHA regulations and CD guidelines, it's always been important. Um, that's what keeps our profession safe. And I will tell you, working, although I'm trained as a dentist, uh, our company works with physicians' offices, veterinary offices, podiatrists, chiropractors, um, surgical centers. I will tell you, I'm really proud of dentistry. Dentistry embraced OSHA way back in 1988. They were really the first to do so, and they still, to this day, do the best job. So we need to do some of the things we've been doing all along because these existing regulations, the ones we've had for years, will help protect your dental team from COVID-19. Remember to continue to provide, to provide training to all your employees on a regular basis. And for OSHA, that means annual training. Annual training is required. So I think I'm trying to find some good things to say about COVID. The only thing I can say, it's going to cause us to up our infection control game to a higher level. So if you haven't done your OSHA training, schedule it. Make sure you do it annually. Um, by the way, one thing I'm really proud of regarding OSHA and regarding employee safety, I mean, do you realize that so far there has not been a single, a single um, uh, case of employees contracting uh, COVID-19 in the dental office? Okay, so, so that's really good. We're doing the right thing. Our masks, our gloves, our glasses, respirators that we're wearing, whatever we're doing, it's working. There's no clusters of SARS-CoV-2 coming out of dental offices, and I, and I want to keep it that way. A little quick background information because you need it. We all know it came from China in December. We all know, I think, it's spread via respiratory droplets. Now, it's really transmitted when these droplets land in the mouth or the nose of another person or inhaled into the lungs. Um, it can go into aerosols, and it can live on surfaces for days but these are not considered main ways of transmission. Um, it can be spread by touching contaminated surfaces and then touching mucous membranes, like touching your nose, mouth, or eyes. But again, th that's not the main way it seems to be transmitted according to CDC data. Um, airborne transmission from person to person over long distances, unlikely. But it is a new disease. We're still learning things. But you know, let me tell you about something I don't even have in this presentation that just came out that I think is really, how would I say, I told you I'm gonna give you some good news, right? To me, it's comforting. Um, there was a case, it made national news, I don't know if you've seen it. Two beauty operators, two hairstylists. They were both positive for COVID-19 and they were symptomatic and they treated 139 clients. Now. You might say, why am I talking about hair salons? Here's why. The hair salon owners, the, or the hair salon employees, these two who are COVID-19 positive, wore masks. All of their clients wore masks. The CDC followed up and studied it. Not one of those clients contracted COVID-19. So think about that. That's just with cloth face coverings or masks. So, so that's why it's so important to do the things that we're going to talk about in this presentation. I feel really comfortable working in a dental office if we do the things we're talking about here. 
Now, people ask me about COVID-19, is it considered bloodborne disease? It's not, but yet you should follow the bloodborne pathogen standard. OSHA's bloodborne pathogen standard will protect you from COVID-19, although it's not considered a bloodborne disease. Signs and symptoms, it's always good to go over them. And when it started out, it was just fever, headache, and cough. But now we know it's shortness of breath, loss of taste or smell. Like the two people I know personally that have COVID-19, that was the first symptom um, that was present, loss of taste and smell. Chest pain, chills or shaking with chills, muscle pain. And again, anybody who develops signs or symptoms, like for example, staff members, I need to seek medical attention. And remember, of course, that it can be spread by people who don't show symptoms. Um, who's at highest risk? People like me, I'm over 60. Individuals with pre-existing medical conditions. And again, one comforting thing at least is that most of the people who've had major problems have comorbidities like diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, lung disease. Or maybe they have a compromised immune system or they're being treated for cancer on some type of immunosuppressant therapy. Now, where we are right now, um, we, we all know that unfortunately, uh, if you watch the evening news every night, um, it's not going the right way in some areas. The emergency rules are still in effect. And they're going to stay in effect for a while. So, so I guess I've gotten over things are just going to get better right away and we'll go back to normal. The things I'm going to talk about, we're going to be practicing this way for a little while. But again, I, some good news. I read a report today that showed a, a, a large group of dental offices has reported in, the, in June their um, numbers were 90% of what they were for the previous June. Now, to do that, they did have to work a few extra hours. They opened some extra time, but we're finding ways to get our production up and to make it profitable. Again, I'd mentioned there's no known clusters coming out of dental offices. There have been out of hospitals, out of nursing homes, restaurants, but not out of dental offices. So we must be doing something right. But again, we don't have a long history on this disease. So we, we don't really have hard data. But what we know is nothing's happened so far. Let's keep it that way. We can do elective procedures. We're all doing them. Of course, PPE is important. And sometimes there's still problems with this PPE supply chain. And if there is, we need to prioritize the most important dental care to preserve that PPE. Now, to prevent transmission, of course, update patients' medical histories before each visit. And do that via email, via phone call. Uh, teledentistry, there's only so much you can do via teledentistry, but one of the things you can do is update medical histories. Um, screen your patients. And some of the questions you should ask are, have you been around anybody with confirmed or suspected case? Have you exhibited any of the signs? And of course, I went over the signs on a previous slide. Um, make sure your staff asks these questions. Advise them that the special screening will be performed when they arrive at the office. So let them know that they're they need to wear a cloth face covering or a face mask, that so they're going to get their temperature taken. Um, and there's a COVID-19 pandemic questionnaire at compliancetrainingpartners.com. Feel free to download it, borrow it, uh, use it for your own. So if anybody answered yes, they need to contact their primary physician or the public health department. They need to reschedule. And I'm sure they'll understand that. Because treatment, let's just say they really need to be treated. Uh, and you suspect they have COVID-19, well, they need to be treated in a facility where airborne precautions are available. We can't really do that in our offices. Airborne precautions would include negative air pressure isolation rooms, things like UV, um, uh, irradiation of the air, HEPA filtration. We can't do that. So work together with a medical provider to identify the appropriate facility for that, which is probably a hospital-based dental facility. If you suspect the patient has COVID-19, it needs to be reported. That's part of our responsibility as healthcare providers. So let's just say you do the screening, you know, pre-visit, you do the phone call, you do everything right, but somehow somebody ends up in your office and you go, oh my gosh, look at they, they've got symptoms. We've got a problem here. They could have COVID-19. What do you do? Immediately put a face mask on them. Send them home if they're not sick. If they're acutely sick, refer them to a medical facility. In other words, help make sure that they get to that local hospital. If dental treatment's urgently needed, again, refer them to a facility, but you can't treat them in your office. You just can't. Now, 
You should also understand that there are certain COVID-19 patients or patients that have had it that can be safely treated in your office. Um, there's two different ways that they can be cleared for that. Let's just say they have COVID-19. They tell you that. Um, it could be, first of all, non-test based. Say they never had a test or they couldn't get a test. So if at least three days have passed since recovery, and that would mean that they haven't had a fever and they're not taking Motrin, they're not taking fever suppressing medication. Also, they've had an improvement in respiratory symptoms and at least 10, day, 10 days have passed since they've had any symptoms they would be deemed safe to treat. Now, if it's test-based, there's three criteria they need to make, meet. That would be resolution of fever, again, without fever-reducing meds, improvement in respiratory symptoms, and also negative results for COVID-19 from at least two consecutive nasopharyngeal swab specimens. And these specimens need to be conducted at least 24 hours apart. So a total of two negative specimens, 24 hours apart. Now, if I have that patient who says that, I would still, this is me personally, I would like to talk to their medical provider. I'd like to make sure that this is the case. So some things you can do to prevent transmission in your office. Um, have a gloved assistant greet the patient at the front door after they text or call from their car. Again, record their temperature. Any reading greater than 100. Um, now, they say 100.4. The CDC says to me, I, I say 100. I'm not sure how active the thermometer is. If it's greater than 100, I'm going to send them for a medical evaluation before I treat them. I don't want to take the chance. Ask the patient not to touch anything in the office. This is assuming you've taken the temperature. They're fine. They're wearing a mask. Have the patient use alcohol-based hand rub. And again, have them wear their cloth face covering or face mask as they're escorted back to the operatory. Have only one patient in the waiting room at a time. Even better, don't have any. Have them walk right into the room. Pre-procedural mouth rinses with an antimicrobial product. Um, it's unclear how effective that is, but there's some data that say it, it helps. We do it. I think it's a good idea. Um, if somebody is accompanying the patient, have them wait in their car. Because remember, if they come in, they need to be screened as well. And this is going to take time. And, and we don't need to eat up more time. Non-essential <laughs> items like remote controls and magazines all need to be out of the waiting room. Because our waiting room used to look so beautiful. Now it looks pretty Spartan. It's going to be that way for a while. Regarding payments, try to conduct payment before or after the visit um, via phone or email. Um, if you have to do it there on spot, try not to handle money. Instead, just a credit card using a clean technique. Ask patients who receive care to let you know. Say, look, if you develop any symptoms, or you're diagnosed with COVID-19 in the next 48 hours, please contact us. Because what we need to do, if we've been exposed and our staff has been exposed, we need to then follow the healthcare personnel with potential exposure guidance. That guidance is on the Compliance Training Partners website. And it's all about things like, did you have any interaction with them without a mask on or without a respirator? Basically, um, if we do the things we're going to talk about in this presentation, you're going to be able to keep working. Throughout the day, disinfect high-tech surfaces. Place signs in strategic places that talk about hand hygiene, respiratory hygiene, cough etiquette. So signs are a great thing. Monitor your staff, of course, every morning. Take their temperature. Um, if they're at all febrile or display any symptoms, they need to go home. Have the treatment room pre-set up so you're not opening drawers, opening cabinets. Again, our treatment rooms, which, um, you know, didn't have a lot of stuff in, but now they're incredibly uh, Spartan. Um, we, everything is covered or everything's in cabinets. So any loose items, they need to be protected. Cover your keyboards with protective barriers and exchange those between patients, even if you didn't use the keyboard. Now, emergencies, you know, I know we're doing elective procedures, but the only reason I'm going to mention emergencies again is because what if there's a shortage of PPE? We ran into something uh, a number of weeks ago where all of a sudden there was a problem with disposable gowns. So all of a sudden we had to see for a few days just emergencies. What's a true emergency? Bleeding, cellulitis, um, something that could compromise the patient's airway, trauma to the face that could compromise the patient's airway. 
or, or dental urgencies. Dental urgencies, we're talking about um, basically pain, pain from pulpal inflammation, pericarditis, third molar pain, dry socket, abscess, tooth fracture, and avulsion or luxation. Also, a final crown cementation of temporary loss. That's considered an urgency. So these are the things that you should focus on if you have a shortage of PPE. Things like gross caries, biopsies if they're needed, suture removals, the denture adjustments on oncology patients, temporary fillings, uh, dental treatment prior to critical medical procedures. What if your patient, uh, I think of it this, this week, we, we had a long-term patient who is going to be irradiated. Um, they have head and neck cancer. Um, obviously, they, they need to have any dental procedures done now because it's going to be a long road, a dry mouth. Those things need to be done. Ortho wires or appliances if they're causing pain. Hopefully, most of you are getting the PPE you need so we don't have to worry about that anymore. Remember that just like before, way before COVID-19, hand hygiene is one of the most important things, even more important now. And one nice thing is people are being more careful. Um, again, COVID-19 is causing us to up our game. Regarding hand hygiene, artificial nails, not recommended. Fingernails should be short and smooth. Don't wear sharp rings or things that are going to pierce your glove like uh, this girl who has far too big of an engagement ring that pierced her glove. Alcohol hand rubs are a great thing. I, I love alcohol hand rubs. I've used them for years. But remember, there's still a need for soap and water. And that would be if hands are visibly soiled. After direct contact with potentially infectious materials, say you, a bare hand touches something, a glove tears. Before and after eating, after toileting. And of course, before a surgical procedure, um, alcohol hand rub alone won't cut it. You would need to use an approved surgical scrub. One of the things that OSHA says and CDC says is it's very important to understand how to properly put on and take off or donning and doffing personal protective equipment. There's a specific order to do it in. Um, improper technique can cause the transmission of disease. So all staff members should receive training, and I've got an easy way for you to do this. It takes up a lot of time to do it in the webinar, and the CDC has a great video, one on donning, one on doffing. And I have those put up for you at the Compliance Training Partners website. Again, click on COVID-19, learn more, and there you'll find these things, which will show you uh, the proper procedure um, for putting on protective equipment taking it off. Now, personal protective equipment, uh, and again, it needs to be left at the office for laundering or pickup by a laundry service. Protective clothing should be changed between patients during COVID-19 period. Now, I'll tell you, in our case, um, imagine when you've got two doctors, three hygienists going, you're doing restorative work, you're trying to go down and, and visit hygienists. In that case, what we do is we would take off um, the gown we have, put on a disposable gown, go down to hygiene. Again, using utilizing disposable gowns. You may use laundered gowns for everything. We found that the, the amount of laundry we're creating was just out of hand. So we're using a combination of reusable that we launder and disposable. Now make sure that you place um, all this protective clothing to be laundered in a fluid-resistant bag like you see in this picture with the biohazard label on it. This is a, a fluid resistant bag, which is what it needs to be with the biohazard label. Remember that gowns are required for all aerosol generating procedures. And we'll go into what those are in a minute. And again, as I mentioned, disposable gowns are a great option. Uh, people have asked a lot about uh, cloth face coverings. Well, a face mask or cloth face covering needs to be worn at all times by dental workers in the office. So at the front desk, walking through the hallway, everywhere. Every minute you're in there, you need to be wearing one. This means the business office staff too. Now, dentists, dental assistants, hygienists, you can all wear cloth face coverings when you're not doing direct patient care. But remember that you need to switch to a surgical face mask or a respirator if you're treating patients. Surgical masks are regulated by the FDA. They have to meet certain testing requirements where a cloth face covering, that's not the case. To preserve surgical masks, cloth face coverings are used. Makes sense if you're having a tough time 
getting the masks that you need, cloth face coverings can be a good option. But they need to be changed if they're soiled, if they're damp. They need to be laundered daily. And everybody needs to perform hand hygiene after they touch them. They can only be worn again when you're not providing direct patient care. Now, this brings up information about or questions about masks. What do different levels of masks mean? Well, first of all, if you're consider, going to be considered a surgical or medical grade mask, you have to filter out 95% of bacteria containing aerosols. There's an organization called ASTM International, and they establish these performance levels. And some of the things they're looking for are bacterial filtration, fluid resistance, again, a minimum of 95% filtration of a bacteria containing aerosol of three micron size droplets has to be achieved. A cloth face covering won't do that. Now, level one mask, they filter out 95% of bacteria, but don't really have much fluid resistance. So I'm not a real fan of those for treating patients. Level two, they filter out 98% and they have moderate fluid resistance. I like those. Level three, they also filter out 98%, but they have high fluid resistance. So for treating patients, I'm a real fan of level two and three, assuming you're not doing an aerosol generating procedure, which is why we're gonna go into this next slide. Um, do dental offices need N95 masks? In most cases, yes. N95 masks are considered respirators by OSHA. They have strict requirements. Just so you understand, a surgical mask really, although it does give us some protection, a surgical mask is basically designed to protect the patient from us or whoever is wearing the mask. If you're in a store and you see somebody wearing a mask, I look at that and say, at least they're being respectful because they're protecting me. Where a respirator has a tighter fit, that's designed to protect the wearer. So if you're going to wear these things, you need to have a written respiratory protection plan, fit testing and a medical evaluation. Now that, that sounds really bad, but I can make it easy. First of all, we have a written respiratory protection plan on the compliancetrainingpartners.com website. Feel free to download it. It's designed specifically for dentistry. We also have a fit testing video on there, and we give information about a medical evaluation. Again, a medical evaluation is, does not necessarily require someone going to the physician. It's a written evaluation that then is reviewed by an MD. Um, 3M, for example, is, is dentist and dental people are all very familiar with 3M. 3M has a very nice program where this can all be done over the internet. So when should you use an N95? It should be used during this pandemic period if you're doing aerosol generating procedures on a patient not suspected of having COVID. That means if you operate a high speed, a low speed, an ultrasonic scaler, an air water syringe, you should be using an N95 mask because these procedures do generate, or at least they have the potential to generate aerosol. Again, I want to emphasize, um, and I'm kind of repeating myself, but, but these are not designed to be used on known or suspected COVID-19 patients in our offices. Those people, again, need to be treated in a special facility. Take a look at the document we have, again, on the website, Respirators versus Surgical Mask and the Respiratory Protection Plan. Feel free to download that stuff. It's, it's yours. Feel free to use it for training if you'd like. Protective eyewear is also very important. It always has been. I, I, I've always preached the fact that 90% of eye injuries in dentistry can be prevented by wearing protective eyewear. So this is nothing new, but it's especially important now because COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2, I should say the virus that causes COVID-19, does have the potential to inoculate you by landing on mucous membranes like the eyes. So when you enter an operatory, a patient's been screened, they don't appear to have COVID-19, a surgical mask with eye protection, that's fine. So a regular level two or three mask, goggles or safety glasses with side shields or a full face shield, they can be worn. But now if you're going to do aerosol generating procedures on a screen patient, now you need to go to the N95 to replace the surgical mask and use a face shield for eye protection. Face shields provide great eye protection, great face protection, but they also protect these N95s from moisture contamination. And I think you know, all of you have been using them, they're hard enough to breathe through anyway. 
we don't need to get them contaminated with moisture. Remember to clean and disinfect your reusable eye protection according to manufacturer's instructions. Also, don't forget the patient. It's really important to protect the patient's eyes. It always has been. I've taught this all along. It's the standard of care. Regarding gloves, we all, you probably wonder, well, why do we have a slide on gloves? But many times, doctors will forget that for any surgical procedure, we need to use sterile surgical gloves, not our exam gloves. You can use non-sterile exam gloves for everything else. For your disposable gloves can't be washed or decontaminated except um, these nitrile, these heavy nitrile utility gloves that you would use for cleaning operatories or scrubbing instruments. Gloves need to be replaced when they're torn. They need to be replaced between patients. Work practice controls are actually defined as policies or procedures designed to reduce exposure to COVID-19 or any other disease entity. So, for example, I've been teaching work practice controls regarding OSHA since 1988. These can include things like encouraging sick employees to stay home. I think we all in dentistry have been guilty of this in the past. You know, somebody comes in, an assistant or us, where you know, sinuses are bothering us, our throat is sore. We say, well, you know, we've got patients, we've got to be there. We wear a mask. In between, we're going back to the restroom and we don't feel good. Those days are over. We need to encourage sick employees to stay home. You need to have flexible, non-punitive sick leave policies. We, we need to remember that that's how we can transmit disease. Try to minimize contact between employees in the office. Encourage work at home arrangements. I know you can't do a lot of that in dentistry. Um, our friends who are in high tech, I mean, they're all working from home. In dentistry, you can't do that. But maybe you can do things like have staff meetings with video conferences. Maybe some of your business office people can do some of their work from at home. At least explore that. Now, you'll notice one thing about this slide. This slide, this person, they, they have short sleeves. And I purposely put it in there because I like to like you to catch this. Before, everybody was wearing short sleeves. We really haven't been, we're not supposed to have been wearing short sleeves for many years. Particularly during COVID-19, you shouldn't wear short sleeves. And I'm hoping even when COVID-19 is over, you won't wear short sleeves because OSHA requires you wear long sleeves. For work practice control, some other important ones are minimize the use of saliva ejectors, particularly um, when you put your lips around them, they can cause backflow. That can be a potential source of cross-contamination. Minimize the use of the air water syringe. This creates aerosols. Minimize the use of, uh, or maximize, I should say, the use of high volume suction. High volume suction is great for removing aerosols. So are devices that connect to it, like an isolite, for example. And utilize four-handed dentistry. Don't go in there and get in a hurry and say, well, the assistant's not quite here yet. Make sure that high volume is turned on because it dramatically decreases aerosol. I know you can't use a rubber dam everywhere, but where you can use it, try to do it. It really decreases aerosol as well. Minimize performing any aerosol generating procedure. I'll give you an example. In our office, I'm not saying this is the only way to do it, but we are doing an aerosol-free hygiene visit. We've explained to the patient that we're not going to be using the ultrasonic scale because it causes an aerosol. We've explained to them that we're not going to polish their teeth at the end with a rotary polisher. And we're going to use, we're going to floss them like we always did. We're going to use a toothbrush that we give them and, and, and polish the teeth with that. But during the pandemic period, people understand this. If you explain it to them, they'll understand it. Try to avoid touching your face because, again, you can inoculate yourself. Allow only the minimum number of people in patient care areas. Re really just keep people out of there that don't need to be in there. I like engineering controls, and I like simple engineering controls. One of the things I'm trying to do is, is I'll tell you where you need to spend money, and, and I'll tell you, tell you where you don't. Um, OSHA talks about engineering controls. CDC talks about engineering controls. But here's some simple ones. If you have an opening window in an operatory, put a small fan in and direct the air to the outside. In other words, don't point the fan in. You're not bringing in outside air. We're talking about actually directing air from that operatory, from that treatment area to the outside. 
Another thing I've always recommended, even more important now, turn your heating and cooling system fan to on during working hours. Now you're getting six, eight, 10 exchanges of air per hour. Don't turn it on auto. On auto, it may be on, it may not. Use local exhaust devices if you have them, like these HEPA filtration devices. I call them these elephant snouts. Not required, but it's an option. They remove, help to remove mist and aerosols. Use directional airflow. I'm going to show you a picture in a minute. Because what you want to do, and this can be done with simple and expensive fans like you see in this picture, you want to direct air from staff work areas towards patient care areas, not the reverse. In other words, we don't want air going from the operatory to the front desk, to the break room, to the lunchroom. We want air coming, moving the direction from the kitchen, from the front desk, towards the operatories, out the window, if you want. Now, take a look at this. I, I like inexpensive. I, I, I like low tech. This is directional airflow. This is showing how fans are pointed down the hall, directing air from the operatories away from the business office, away from the kitchen. And then it kind of culminates in this. We have a couple of opening windows where the fans are pointed to the outside and it exhausts the air. Notice too that this fan is at the patient's foot. So it's pulling the air from the patient out the window. I wouldn't really want a fan box behind the patient um, that was pulling air from the patient to the operator. And here it is, simple, low tech, inexpensive. I think those fans were 15 bucks. Another thing um, regarding engineering controls, run your bathroom vent fans during working hours. This is another great way to keep air moving. Consider consulting a heating and cooling person. Again, these aren't expensive things. I hate to see you go out and spend thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars to equip all your operatories with individual devices when you might be able to have a heating and cooling person do some relatively inexpensive things like increase your filtration efficiency by maybe putting in a new filter system where you can put in HEPA filters instead of regular furnace and air conditioning filters. Maybe they can put in a uh, UV device. I'll show you a picture of one in a minute. If you have operatories that are open, um, you need to put curtains or something in between them. Um, in our case, our operatories are divided by cabinetry. That's fine. We try to use our closed-in rooms. We've only got a couple truly closed-in rooms when possible. Uh, that's even better. Plexiglass barriers, these viraguards, are very important. This is what we have at our front desk. We have this between uh, the patient and, and, and the um, staff. We also have these in our lunchroom. We have several of them, so up to four people can eat there at a time with these viraguards between them. Now, here's again, I, I'm about simple, I'm about inexpensive. Here is a HEPA filter that was installed on the furnace on the right. Here on the left is a UV device that actually works on your existing heating and cooling system. So again, there's a lot of different ones out there. Talk to a heating and cooling person. You'll be surprised that it won't be that expensive. Other precautions, when people enter the office, perform hand hygiene. Counsel all your staff to do that. Staff members should wash their hands before they leave as well. And they should wear a cloth face mask or cloth face covering when they arrive at the office and when they go home. Staff members also should disinfect areas they touch in their car. Very easy to do. If you give them some wipes, tell them to disinfect the steering wheel and the handles. Dental team members should also consider removing their clothes when they get home and taking a shower. Even though you're leaving your clothing, your protective clothing at the office, this is clothing I'm talking about that you might be wearing under it, or at least it's been at the office. Why not take it off right away? Why not launder it separately? Again, all things that we can do to make things a little safer. This particular poster has been required. Uh, it needs to be uh, up, but now. Uh, especially it's important. I've been recommending that this poster be up for respiratory hygiene cough etiquette for years and years, but now I recommend putting one not only in the waiting room, but at several places through the office. Make sure you provide tissues and no-touch receptacles in the waiting room uh, and throughout the facility. Placing masks on patients who are asymptomatic is a, or are, that are symptomatic is especially important. And now with COVID-19, we want a mask on a patient all the time, except when we're treating them. 
Environmental surfaces, of course, need to be disinfected. They always have. This is nothing new. The only thing is make sure that your disinfectant is approved by the EPA against SARS-CoV-2. SARS-CoV-2, of course, is the virus that when transmitted to humans causes the disease COVID-19. So continue to follow the, the existing guidelines that we have, these CDC guidelines for infection control. These have been out there for a long time. If you're not familiar with them, they can be found on the Compliance Training Partners website. In other words, the things we've been doing for years help to keep us safe, even with COVID-19. And, you know, I've been involved in dentistry for over 35 years. And a lot of you have been involved in dentistry a long time, too. And do you notice that dental people are very healthy? There's not clusters of respiratory disease coming out of dental offices. Dental, dental office personnel are very healthy. Our masks, our gloves, our glasses, the things we've been using all along are working. And we, want, we just want to up our game. That's all we want to do. Now, the EPA actually publishes a list called List N of disinfectants that are effective against SARS-CoV-2. Now, I'm going to tell you that most of the name brand disinfectants are on that list. But if you have any doubt if yours is approved for that, again, at our website, you'll find this list and look for your disinfectant. Another important thing, follow all the instructions for that disinfectant. Maybe we've all been guilty in the past of, of spraying it on or wiping it on and, and, and too quickly, not giving enough time. Make sure you use the proper contact time. Follow the instructions for use on your disinfectant. Clinical contact surfaces, these are things you actually touch or that spray, spatter, instrument contact, things that are very likely to, in fact, be contaminated. Here you need to use an EPA-registered hospital disinfectant that has a tuberculocidal claim. Again, this is nothing new. I've always recommended this, but it should be on list N. Barrier wrap where possible. And remember, another reason we want to be so careful screening, because the CDC says that if a COVID-19 symptomatic patient presents in your operatory, now you need to clean, disinfect, or discard surfaces, supplies, or equipment located within six foot of the patient. But let's just make sure one of those potential COVID-19 patients doesn't get into our office. Housekeeping surfaces, we're talking floors, walls, unused counter, limited risk of disease transmission. And here you can use an EPA-registered low-level disinfectant. Now, for... Instrument processing and sterilization, you might say, I'm surprised in this course we're going to go over this, but the CDC is emphasizing. Fortunately, SARS-CoV-2 is not hard to kill. But still, remember the basics. Make sure that your staff knows in your sterilization area the four areas that that sterilization area is divided into. Your receiving, cleaning, decontamination, your prep and packaging area, your actual sterilization equipment, and then your storage. Because First of all, instruments need to be clean before sterilization. Maybe use an instrument washer. Maybe use an ultrasonic. Maybe you use hand scrubbing. Maybe you use a combination. Make sure you have internal and external indicators on your packaging that's required. Remember not to interrupt your sterilization cycle. That means the drying cycle too. If, if you're interrupting that drying cycle, you probably need more instruments or another autoclave or both. Remember, too, weekly spore testing of autoclaves is required, all autoclaves. Now, these four areas, they need to be clearly delineated. This, this is a nice-looking sterilization center, and you can see the area one is really from uh, the sink and left. Area two, prep and packaging, is the countertop there. Three is the sterilizer. Four is storage. And for most of us, I think you'd agree, most of four is in the operatory. And the reason I want to go over this is make sure everybody understands this. I don't want you to have a sterilization disaster. And, and almost every week at Compliance Training Partners, we get this call. The call is, what do we do? We just found out we worked on X number of patients with instruments that weren't sterile. And you say, well, how can that happen? Very easily, if two, where things are packaged and they look shiny, they look nice, somehow either bypasses three and goes to four or gets put in three and doesn't get sterilized. Uh, these are a nightmare. It involves the public health department. It involves contacting the patient. You don't want to have that happen. One of the things that CDC states is that after a period of non-use like we had during uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, 
testing dental unit water is extremely important. It's, it's really been important all along. It needs to be done quarterly. Shocking the system should have been done. Routine maintenance of the autoclave, make sure that's being done. Contact Shine, make sure that you get a tech out there and that they do that. That needs to be done at least once a year. Spore test all your sterilizers. And of course, run evacuation system cleaner through the suction system. I will tell you that we are, we always did it um, at least every other day. We now do it every day, and we try to run some between patients through the suction system. Dental unit water, always been important. Uh, I want to make sure your dental unit water doesn't look like this. Okay, and the only way you know is if you test. The CDC states dental unit water needs to be under 500 colony forming units. The ADA says it needs to be under 200. If we were practicing in Europe, it needs to be under 100. But, but this is all really achievable if you do some of the things we'll talk about. The problem is dental units have small tubing, and small tubing has high surface to volume ratio, bacteria biofilms form. And dental unit water that's not maintained properly will absolutely exceed accepted levels. And remember too that major lawsuits have been filed by patients against dentists with high levels of bacteria. Let's not let that be you. They may have got that somewhere else. It doesn't matter. I, I, I want you to have tests. And if you have tests like this, take cell phone records of them and keep them so you can prove you're doing this. Again, spore testing weekly and keep these records for three years to protect yourself so that you can prove that you're doing things the right way. I want you to protect your business. We, we've got a tough time out there. We're at working, seeing 70, 80% of the patients we used to. PPE costs are up. Patients are nervous. Insurance reimbursement is down. We, we need to make sure we don't get our business in trouble. And a lot of the things I'm talking about here are liability protection as well as personal protection. Remember that if you have a positive spore test, that means that that autoclave didn't work. So you don't have to recall items right away because the odds are very good when you retest, it will be fine. But shut that machine down immediately retest. Don't use it until it passes that second test, which is why you should have adequate backup sterilization. Make sure if your main autoclave is down, you have enough backup capacity, you can still run your business. If the device fails a second time, recall and reprocess all items from that sterilizer. And again, uh, you start using the backup sterilizer. Hopefully you have enough excess capacity. Evacuation system cleaning again, should be conducted daily because it can be very expensive when you don't. It can destroy a system over time as the lumen of that suction system gets smaller and smaller. Consider doing it between patients. And I'm talking about this for 20 seconds. We just do a little bit between patients, a 20, 30 seconds between to clean out that system. But in addition to making it safer, it eliminates costly repairs. Remember to use a neutral pH product or it can destroy the effectiveness of your amalgam separator. As you know, amalgam separators are required throughout the United States now, but a product that's not a neutral pH can leach mercury from that amalgam separator, put it back into the environment. So consider a bacterial-based product. Start from the farthest operatory from the suction pump, aspirate through each high volume and saliva ejector line. You'll save yourself a lot of money over time. Remember that the dental staff always needed training, even more important now, annual training required, when to use PPE, what PPE is necessary, how to put it on, how to take it off, how to disinfect it, the limitations of it. In other words, the mask that this lady is wearing will not protect her against aerosols. There you need to go to a respirator. I think one of the really important things is to reassure our patients, reassure our staff. And, and I think communication is so important. Patients really understand and they appreciate the communication. The same with staff. Let your dental team know you're monitoring the situation. Let them know that you're attending webinars like this, that you're following the latest OSHA and CDC guidelines. And make sure they have this information to communicate with patients. And that means also your business office people. Your, your front desk people are getting questions all the time. Is it safe to come back to your office? What are you doing different? They, they want to know. Let, let your front desk people be as knowledgeable about your infection control system as your back office people. 
And of course, let everybody know that their safety is of prime importance. Let them know about that great sterling record that dentistry has. There's no clusters of COVID-19 coming out of any dental office. Again, I'd invited you to visit the Compliance Training Partners website where you have information, the latest information about COVID-19, fit testing, respirators. Um, our technical service people are also glad to answer your questions uh, about this. Also, you'll be able to find this presentation on the website as well. Now, at this point, what I'd like to do is Adam, if, if you are available, I know we have a lot of questions and I would like to answer questions and see if we, we can't answer those questions that I haven't answered during the presentation. Absolutely, we sure do have a lot of questions. So let's jump right in. First question is, if an employee goes on vacation, are they required to, to get a COVID test before returning to work? Um, no, they're not. Um, you may... Um, request that of them, but it's certainly not a requirement. I think what would be important would be to screen them much like using the same, well, using the same questions you're screening your patients with. Um, where did you travel? Were you around any known um, people who had COVID-19 or suspected COVID-19? And of course, the, the temperature check for symptoms, but no, no specific requirement for that. If you are performing a non-aerosol generating procedure, do the gowns need to be replaced after each use? They do. At this point, um, you should be, even if, give an example, um, a hygiene exam. Our hygienists call us in to do an exam. We're going to go in with a new disposable gown um, on, on, that we just put on just for that patient. We're going to remove it as soon as we walk out of that ap operatory. So yes, at this time in the pandemic, the answer is yes. What options do offices have if they want OSHA training now? Probably um, the, the best options will be, first of all, contact your Henry Schein representative. Um, good percentage of them are, are certified to provide OSHA training in the office, and they're able to issue CEs for that. And they're also able to provide the COVID-19 training module as well. So you can really uh, kill several birds with one stone, your OSHA, your infection control, COVID-19 training. The other option would be to talk to your rep about online training. Uh, that, that's, that's another good option, good and acceptable option that you can also earn CE credits for. What is the protocol if an employee tests positive for COVID? Is it different if more than one employee tests positive? The first thing that I would do, um, even, even as well as I know this, if I had um, a known or suspected COVID-19 patient or a positive or a staff member for COVID-19, I'm going to go to my own website, Compliance Training Partners, I'm going to look at the CDC guidelines for um, healthcare employees with potential exposure to COVID-19. Uh, obviously, that person would immediately need to be sent home. They um, couldn't work to come back to work, of course, until they've been cleared. The problem we're left with is who have they been exposed to? Now, if they've done things, as we've talked about in this presentation, worn a mask all the time, when they have interaction with each other, social distancing, it will probably just be a matter of observing the other employees, but it also may involve having them tested. But again, follow the CDC guidelines. They're different depending on what personal protective equipment you've been wearing and what work situation there is. Um, it, what I might suggest you do is go to the Compliance Training Partners website and review this even before you have such a thing happen so you'll be prepared. All right, I have a scenario for you. Um, we are a small dental office and our sterilizer fails. If we don't have a backup sterilizer because we don't have the space, what should we do? Can we sterilize our instruments at a neighboring dental office or what are our options at that point? I'll tell you if, um, give you an example. I, I have a, 
a good friend who practices in Manhattan, where, as you know, real estate is a premium, offices are very small, and they do not have room for a backup sterilizer. What they do have is one large sterilizer. They happen to have an M11, and they have a statum, which is, in essence, it's a, it, it is also an autoclave, smaller capacity. So what they do, and I think this is a good suggestion, is either one, they use the smaller autoclave, the statum, or two, they would take it to a neighboring dental office. There's no problem if you sterilize it in the autoclave of another dental office. Again, as long as you have internal and external indicators, those packages come out and they're not compromised. In other words, they're not torn in transit between that office and your office. There would be nothing wrong with that. Another suggestion I might give is consider you know, as much as we can produce in dentistry a day and as much as our overhead is, maybe your basic instruments, buy some more instruments so you have an excess capacity of instruments to get you by a couple of days without autoclave. If a patient has tested positive for COVID and had been quarantined for 14 days, when is it advisable to see them? When they do come in, should I be taking any special precautions? Well, I stated in, in, in the seminar, there's a non-test-based way and there's a test-based way to then accept them as cleared and able to come into your office. I will tell you the policy in my office is if someone had COVID-19, I want to see test-based. I want to see the two, um, two tests over 24 hours apart that are negative. Um, you could make that your office policy. I would certainly, at a minimum, want to talk to their physician or the, per the person who treated them for that to make sure that they're clear. In other words, I, if somebody says in the phone, look, I have a COVID-19, I'm over it, it's been 14 days, so I'd like to come in for a hygiene appointment. We're going to say, whoa, 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 we need to see the results of two negative tests because we don't want to start that whole chain reaction where now our staff is exposed, they have to be tested, et cetera. That, that would be my advice. All right. Kind of a two-part question here. Part one, is it reasonable to allow staff who are out for sick days to return to work once they appear healthy if their symptoms do not align with COVID symptoms? What sort of wait time would you recommend? And then part two, if a staff member is infected and they tested positive with full symptoms, no one else in the office was compromised. When should you allow them to come back? Would you recommend all of that staff member's household also test negative at least one or two times? Um, and, and one thing I'll, I'll, I'll say to Adam is I, I want one thing that I didn't mention during um, the presentation is I want to mention that at the um, end of the presentation, uh, Henry Schein is going to send you a detailed infection control checklist and a detailed OSHA compliance checklist, which will, will also help answer some of these questions. So do look for that in your email box. And I would suggest everybody go through that carefully. And, and it's a go, no-go list to show you where you're in compliance and where you're not. Um, regarding this question, if someone had, the first part, of it, if I recall, Adam, is that Someone had symptoms, uh, but, but, but they weren't yet diagnosed with COVID-19, and, and obviously they, they, they would be sent home. When could they come back? Now, did that assume that they, they did have a test or they didn't have a test? I don't recall. It just says, quote, unquote, sick days, that they're out for sick days. Here's what I would say. In my office, if someone um, displayed respiratory disease symptoms, before COVID-19, I simply uh, would have said, you know, 48 hours after you've not had a fever, you're no longer febrile, you're not taking fever-reducing medications, you have no more symptoms of respiratory disease, that's time to come back. That would be in pretty, pretty much in guidelines with what the CDC says. But with COVID-19, that changes the game. During this pandemic period, if someone in my office displayed respiratory disease symptoms, they weren't tested, they went home, I would insist they have a test before they presented back to work. I think out of fairness to 
the staff I would need to do that. This is a different time. COVID-19 pandemic period, the rules are changed. Um, you'd also mentioned part two of the question if they, I believe if they did in fact have a positive test, is that correct? Yes. If they had a positive test, of course, again, immediately they would go home. And what you would then do is again, go to the website, follow the CDC's protocols for, because you have to assume that everybody in that office, every, every employee in that office had potential exposure to COVID-19. Also, you would want to see which patients they interacted with. So what you would then need to do would be uh, contact tracing would start. You'd want to contact the local public health department if you want to follow that guidance. And again, the good news is for most of the dental staff members, if they had on that cloth face covering, that mask, social distancing, barriers, um, you're not going to have to shut the office down. You can follow their guidance, which is basically going to be a wait and watch. Um, again, look, I'm, I'm going to really encourage everybody because I know it's so important to look at that CDC guidance on our website so you'll know what to do if suddenly someone comes in and says, hey, I'm not coming in, or somebody calls and says, I tested positive for COVID-19. I'm not coming in today. You need to know what to do. And it's kind of a flow chart depending on who they came into contact with, what type of contact, what type of PPE both parties were wearing. Is it required that gowns be changed between patients or is it just recommended? Um, here's the way I look at it. The, where, the, where OSHA is a law, federal laws, compliance officers, fines. CDC is really, if you, if you look at CDC, their guidelines, even our infection control guidelines are CDC guidelines for infection control. Well, the guidance they're giving is to change gowns between patients. But you've got to understand that CDC um, really is the gold standard. And any public health department is going to hold you to that standard. Any court of law is going to hold you to that standard. And trust me, guys and gals on this call, I, I'm, I'm one of your fellow practitioners. I, I'm not some um, you know, idealist. I, 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 I want us to make a living but I want to protect our business. My responsibility in this webinar more than anything is to protect your business. And I'm going to tell you that if somebody contracted a disease and you weren't doing the things that were in the CDC guidance, you've got no defense. So although it's a guidance, it might as well be a law. It's the gold standard. It's what everybody expects you to do. Don't get yourself into trouble, please. What would you say is the main difference between an N95 mask and a KN95 mask? Um, here's the difference. In fact, there's a world of difference. Early in the game, we thought a KN95 was the equivalent of an N95. Um, what we were told originally was that KN95 really met the same testing criteria, but that it wasn't yet approved in the United States. In other words, our uh, NIOSH, had not, uh, National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, hadn't had a chance to test them. A KN95, on the other hand, was improve, approved in Asian countries like China, South Korea, different areas. But here's what they found when they started testing them, that very, very few of them would pass the criteria set by N95. So for the most part, they are not as good at protecting the operator as an N95. I would really try to go with an N95. And I know myself, I've worn both. The N95 has, uh, it's tighter fitting. It has a better seal. It has an upper strap and a lower strap that keeps it tight against your face. Most of the KN95 simply have air loops and they're just not as effective. I'm not a real fan of Staying on the topic of masks, if my office cannot access N95 masks, are cone masks better than ear loop masks because of the fit around the face? For me, the key thing would be that you're using um, a proof surgical mask, and I would go for either a level two or a level three because both have some fluid resistance. Again, level two, moderate, 
level three, uh, much better food resistance. I, everything that I've seen shows that the soft masks, not the cone masks, the soft masks seem to have a better seal around the face than the cone mask. So that would be my preference, would be the softer mask. Um, again, maybe you can prioritize things so that you, you just use N95s when you generate an aerosol. If you create that non-aerosol generating hygiene visit, that's where you use most of your respirator, would, would normally use most of your respirators right there. If you just use it when you're running the high speed, the low speed, or the air water syringe, um, maybe you can save a few respirators and, and, and not go in and practice dentistry with an aerosol with a mask. I'd much rather see you wearing an N95. Can disposable gowns be put in regular trash or do they have to be treated as medical waste? Well, the good news is there they can be treated as regular, regular waste, regular trash. They do not need to be read there. We are a surgical center and use blankets for recovering patients. Do the blankets need to be washed between each patient or is there a quicker way we can disinfect them between uses? I would say during this COVID-19 pandemic period, I believe that your only choice would be you're going to have to purchase more blankets. I don't really, I think the standard of care would be to use a, a, a freshly laundered. It doesn't have to be disinfect. It doesn't have to have any specific laundering requirements, just regular laundering between patients. Uh, my answer would be, I think you're going to need a bigger inventory of those blankets because I know of no effective way to quickly um, decontaminate them between patients. Given the new aerosol guidelines, what structural changes should my office make? Think, think about in the presentation, one of the things I really like, I really like, um, first of all, the emphasis on some of the things we already have, careful and diligent four-handed dentistry, where that high volume evacuator is right there. Um, I also think directional airflow, trying to pull that air from the patient, pushing it from the operator towards the patient and then hopefully out a window out or out of a vented area. Maybe you could consider putting a couple more vent fans in. It wouldn't be that expensive to um, uh, cut in a couple of vent fans compared, compared to some of these extremely expensive suction devices. But it's all about better movement of air. I think the way you should structure it would be to have air moving the right direction away from the operator towards the patient out the window. I also think making sure your heating and cooling system, maybe your heating and cooling person can up the capacity so that there's a bigger fan. It's moving more cubic feet of air per minute, um, better filtration. I like simple solutions. So those are the things that I think will make it safe. Is fit testing mandatory for N95 users? What if we wear a KN95? Um, it, it, it is mandatory for respirator. Now, actually, fit testing would be required for an N95 or a KN95 because they're both considered respirators. A fit test, also a written respiratory protection plan, which again, you can download from our website, and a medical evaluation, which again, can be done uh, online. I suggest 3M. I think it costs it was $29 a piece, something like that, for that medical evaluation. Not unreasonable at all. Um, think, though, about what I said about the KN95. I probably didn't make it clear. It is considered a respirator. It does require fit testing. The problem is, is when they fit test them, they don't pass the very high rate where an N95 does. All right. Well, we do still have tons more questions, but we're about 10 minutes over the hour. So I want to be respective of everyone's time. If we, if you asked a question that we did not get to you, we'll work with Carson to try and get an answer back to you as soon as possible. So with that, I do want to thank you, Carson, for the great information today and thank everyone for attending today's webinar. If you have additional questions that you think of, please email us at webinars at henryshine.com. Or on the last slide of the presentation, there was a phone number that Carson had. You can always call that number and someone will get with you as soon as possible. Within the next week, everyone 
attending can expect the link with today's recording of the webinar. So on behalf of Henry Shine, I'd like to once again thank Carson for his time today. Everyone stay safe and have a good night. Thank you.